In the midst of a violent forest fire in Yosemite National Park, firefighters encountered an unknown and terrifying creature that might just be more dangerous than the blaze itself. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails if you want to see the absolutely insane modern Looney Tunes scenes that are more vile than the stories I tell, like Bugs Bunny shoving human organs down someone's throat. Anyway, today's episode features a thrilling and terrifying Yosemite National Park story, disturbing encounters at cabins in the woods, and inhuman home invaders who might want to eat your children. Enjoy, and be sure to send me your scary encounters with the unexplained at darkstories.org. And hey, show some love to my other shows too, by going to eeriecast.com and checking them out, or just search for EerieCast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Now, let's begin. There are monsters in Yosemite National Park. From Adam. There were fires in Yosemite National Park here in California on June 26, 2022. They were the Washburn fires that spread quickly. These fires revealed something that science cannot explain. I am a firefighter, and during the fires earlier this year in California, a lot of rescue crews were called to help. I swear on everything I hold dear to me that there has to be some sort of monster or monsters in that national park. Myself and three other firefighters saw something that changed our lives. Two days before we got sent to deal with the Washburn forest fires, our captain told us that they needed volunteers and that our department was able to send four of us. That would be me, J, E, and S. I went home and told my wife what was going on, that I had to leave to help out with the Washburn fires. At 3.30 a.m. on June 26th, I was awakened by a call from S. Yeah, what is it? I said. S replied, Hey Adam, I know it's early, but we've been asked to come leave ASAP. Seems the fire is spreading pretty fast, and the crews there need help towards the northern side of the fire. I told him I'd meet him at E's place. He said he'd already called Jay, that Jay was already on his way to my house. I got up and told my wife what's going on. She didn't say anything, she just looked at me, concerned. Finally, after about a minute of silence, she said, I love you, please be careful. I replied, I love you too, don't worry, I'm gonna be fine. I truly believed that. Being a firefighter for almost six years, I learned a thing or two. I got ready and set my bag by the door. I started to make myself a cup of coffee when my phone notification went off. It was Jay. Said he'd be pulling up in a minute. I looked out the kitchen window and I saw Jay pulling up in the front yard. I met him at the door and invited him inside, asking if he'd like a cup of coffee, but he declined, saying he had some in the truck as well as several packs of Red Bull. We set off then, meeting at E's place, where we loaded up into two trucks packed with all of our gear. Living in California, if you don't know, it's hot during the summer, and at that time in the morning it was about 77 degrees, but during the day, away from the fire, it was about 103. We drove for two hours, and by then we got pretty close to base camp when we saw some animals running away from the fires off to the side of the road. E said over the radio from the other truck that we needed to slow down to avoid hitting any deer or something else. Jay responded, You're only cautious because you don't have insurance. We laughed and carried on more cautiously. By the time we made it to base camp, we could see the hillside glowing in the distance. We saw rescue crews pulled over on the side of the road. We stopped and asked about the situation. One of them said he had to pull the camp farther back due to how much smoke was coming through. Crews were coming down there, setting up a new camp here. We put the hazard lights on, pulling off next to the other unit. A few minutes later, about 18 more units showed up. That's a lot of people trying to get control over this blaze, which was now quite close to a small town and some homes. Another two units kept going past us. The captain commented that the campers who had been found were alive, but they had inhaled a lot of smoke and were suffering from dehydration. One of them had mild burns. We got geared up, 
checked our masks and tanks, got our axes ready, and were given a starting position. Now, controlling the spread of fires and keeping a lookout for all of your men and other people is trouble. Fighting this blaze went on for weeks, rotating crews and six-hour shifts. This fire was massive when we got there in the beginning, and it was only about 20% contained. We got a call that one of the civilians at the Southgate Brewing Company reported that they had a younger brother, who had not been heard from in a couple of hours, that he was supposed to be back at his cabin. Our unit was the closest to it, so we went to check it out. That call came on July 2nd. S and I had gotten our things ready, and he was almost done sharpening our axes since we have to keep them well maintained in these situations. Jay was getting the location of the cabin while he and the captain marked a route, trying to figure out the best way possible at the moment. We left about half an hour later. We took the ATVs that were available to use, and we made our way to the location of the cabin. On the way there, we saw other crews working and the sound of helicopters overhead. An hour into our search and rescue, we found the cabin covered with fire retardant from helicopters flying above. Even so, it had some fire damage. E notified base camp that we found the cabin and gave them a description. Over our radios, we heard base camp give us the okay to search, but to be cautious of the structure, they let us know that another unit was heading our way to provide support. J and S checked the sides to make sure we could enter, but E already went in like an idiot. Worried about E, I followed him instead of waiting. We went inside. It was smoky still, but what was much worse was the body we found. It was burned, but it looked like it had been torn into first. We stood there horrified. Jay said, what the heck happened here? S was walking around, checking, and suddenly a loud crash was heard. We looked back. S was gone. We scrambled to where we saw him last. We heard him yell and looked around. His cries seemed to be coming from a crawl space trap door kind of thing on the cabin. S yelled up at us to get a rope because his ankle had been broken. Now a lot of people might assume a five foot drop like that wouldn't be dangerous, but our gear weighs between 70 and 80 pounds on a normal day, and during large fires, it could contain an extra 20 pounds. Jay asked S if he could stand up. He tried. He was able to get up and lie against the wall. E tossed the rope down to him. As he was wrapping the rope around himself, he looked up at us and began to laugh. He joked, saying at least the axe didn't go up his butt. We laughed, but carefully got him out. J and E got him to the door. I went and pulled the ATV around close to him, and I got him on board. E checked his foot. No blood, which was a good sign, but his foot was swelling up like a balloon. Jay volunteered to take him back to base, and we agreed. E told me to grab a camera off the ATV to take photos of the scene because of the body inside. We finished up, called it in, relaying all the information back to camp. The captain told us the unit coming to help us had to be turned around and that we needed to head back ourselves, but we weren't finished with the scene yet. By the time we were done there, we realized it was mid-afternoon. E went back inside at one point, slowly walking in so as to not disturb anything of the scene. Then he called me inside. I went in and saw him pointing his flashlight into the hole in the floor. Look, animal tracks. They look like dog prints, but a lot bigger. Now, I was assuming it was a big dog. I didn't really believe in any sort of supernatural stuff. We left that cabin, and standing there right next to our ATVs, we saw something. There was this tall dog-looking thing, or perhaps some weird bear. I don't know what it was exactly, but when I saw it, I just stood there, frozen in shock. Then I was yanked backwards. I hit my back in the floor. E slammed the door shut, well, what was left of it, and he slid the charred couch and dresser in front of the door. I tried to ask what he was doing, but he put his hand to my mouth and glared at me, as if to say, quiet. Now, E is ex-military. He'd been in the army for eight years. I've never seen this man show an ounce of fear, but there he was, pale white, 
he looked how I felt. He began to look around, axe in hand. He checked the three windows without touching them, but the one that was broken he covered with a small end table that he stuffed quietly to the frame of it. We both looked at each other then, not saying a word. Then we both remembered there was a massive hole in the floor. We looked around, then had an idea. We flipped the kitchen table onto its top, then slid it over the hole. We were thankful it was big enough to cover it. I whispered over to E. We're gonna have to leave soon. But he told me to simply listen. I wasn't sure what he was talking about. He shushed me and said listen again. What? All I hear is the wind and fire. Exactly. Something that big out there has not made a single noise. We called the captain up on the radio. We said we were stuck in the structure as it collapsed and we needed evacuation. We heard them say that Metaflight was on its way. We let them know to be cautious as a frightened bear was in our vicinity. The captain acknowledged that information. You think we can make it to the ATVs? I asked E. He paused before he said anything and he looked at me. I'm not sure. Did you see that thing's hands or paws or whatever the heck it had? No, no I didn't. I just saw its face. You think it's some idiot in a ghillie suit? No way that was a person. Too big. Those who know how tall ATVs are, this thing's knees were about the height of the handlebars. Outside, it looked as if it was getting dark out. In reality, I think the winds had shifted and smoke began to push towards us. We knew we'd be in trouble soon. Plus, we had less than an hour of air in our tanks. The timer on our watches began to sound. Suddenly, the back wall where the bathroom was at sounded like someone was kicking a bass drum as hard as they could, just louder. We shot straight up, axes in hand. Then, even through our helmets, we could hear this deep growl. There was such bass to it. We could feel it in our chests. We were only a few feet from this thing, and all that stood between it and us was a weak door. Adrenaline and fear coursed through my body. We heard the helicopter coming closer. E spoke. We need to move closer to the door, now. We rushed to the door. I pushed the small couch out of the way as E knocked the shelf out of the way too. We pulled the door open. Then, as we did, the table over the hole flew straight up, and this brown furred creature stood up there. It was waist high from the hole. The two of us ran out, shutting the door hard behind us. Metaflight was just overhead. They lowered a rope ladder. We quickly scrambled to it and climbed as fast as we could. Finally, after forever of climbing, we were inside the helicopter, gasping for air. He looked at me. We, we made it. I looked over at one of the medics on board. Then E told the pilot to wait. He grabbed a flare camera, and through the infrared, he grew pale. I could tell even through his dirty face. Get us out of here, he shouted. He sat back down. I could see tears making a clear path along his soot-covered face. We made it back to base, where Jay met us when we landed. He went with us to get checked out. He asked what happened. I said the building fell on us. While we rested in the medical tent, I looked over at E. What did you see through the camera? Slowly, he looked up at me, and he said simply, Six. More tears fell down his face. It took me a second to understand what he was saying. We had been surrounded. There were six of those things around and in the cabin. We were both flown to the nearest hospital, where we had to stay for a few days. After that, we were cleared to come back, and I didn't mind, but only if it meant helping out at the edges to stop the progression of the fire. On August 22nd, weeks later, they finally got it under control. Soon after that, E resigned, getting a job working as security. A few weeks back, at the beginning of October, E and I told S and J what really happened. J, midway through his drink, coughed and sped out his beer. <laughs> really? <clears throat> about four days before the fire, we found a group of six by a small pond about two miles away from the cabin. They all appeared normal. 
but they gave off this weird vibe. They refused treatment, said they'd only been in the area because their car broke down. Funny enough, we didn't find any cars, nothing of the sort on the service roads. All six of them were big guys too, about six foot four and easily over 230 pounds. I asked, could you recognize them if you saw them again? Oh yeah, you don't forget these kinds of people. They made me want to leave them there and never come back. Then he spoke up. I understand that feeling. I work with a big guy, a security guard like me. Makes me feel uneasy, like I need to get away from him. S laughed. Hey Jay, that's probably one of your werewolf friends. I laughed, tossing my empty beer bottle back into the box to grab another. Hey, Adam. E said. I looked up at him and said, What's up? He pointed his bottle towards a green pickup truck that was pulling in down the street. Uh, what about it? Well, that's the truck the guy at work drives, but the owner said he was on vacation or hunting or something. We all looked up at the truck. A large man was just getting out. We all laughed. S said, let's invite him in for a beer. The sun was setting and we all began getting ready to leave S's place. We put the chairs back in the garage, picking up the bottles from his driveway. As Jay was walking to his truck, the guy with the green truck at the house at the end of the street got into his truck and began heading down the road. He slowed down and pulled right up next to E's window while he was sitting in his car. Hey, ain't you the new guy at work? E replied, uh, yeah? Pretty chill job, ain't it? I'll catch you later. He then drove off in that green Dodge pickup, and all I could think about was how dirty that truck looked. I looked over at Jay and he stood there staring straight at the truck. I asked if he was alright. Did you have too much to drink, buddy? I added, trying to be funny. He looked straight at me. Adam, that was one of the guys I was telling you about. The Man in the Hat from Anonymous. I was around seven years old when this happened. Our house had four floors, the attic, second floor, first floor, and the basement. The first event was in my basement. I was down in the common area in the basement, which is where I used to watch Scooby-Doo. It was my favorite show at the time. I was alone downstairs and about halfway through the movie I was watching, all the lights suddenly turned off and the TV screen went to static, as if somehow the TV didn't receive any signal. Confused, I then felt a hand on my shoulder. Immediately, I stood up from my seat and turned around, looking into the darkness. In an instant then, the lights turned back on. I saw that no one was there. I was still alone. The second encounter I had was on the second floor, it happened about a year later. I had had a nightmare, so I asked my parents if I could sleep in their bed for the night. They said yes. In the morning, the sun shining through the window woke me up. I opened my eyes and I looked into the hallway. That's when I saw what looked to be a man. He was almost the height of the doorway. He wore an old-fashioned business suit and a fedora. In that moment, I tried to rub my eyes because I thought I was seeing things. But then I noticed I couldn't move. I tried, I tried so hard to move anything, but no part of me would budge. I watched that figure pull out what appeared to be a pocket watch. Then he turned and walked away. When he was just out of sight, I was able to get up, so I ran down the hallway with my Nerf gun. I heard footsteps going down the stairs, so I ran to them but I didn't see anyone going down. I searched and searched, but found no one, though the footsteps continued here and there, and to this day it creeps me the heck out. Fast forward four years, we began living in a new house. It wasn't a small house, but it also wasn't a big one. I really liked it either way. One day, my mom and dad wanted to go out and have a date, so they left me to babysit my little brother. It was going well for the first hour. 
but soon I heard something knock over a few water bottles in the garage. Now, our garage had a normal door and two garage doors leading outside. The one normal door led inside. That inside door had a peephole on it, so I decided I would head over to look through the peephole. As I was on my way there, I heard a huge crash in the garage. So I grabbed my little brother and put him in the bathroom. I told him to lock the door. He did as I asked. Then I made my way to the garage door, but not before I grabbed a knife from the kitchen just in case. When I finally looked through the peephole, I'll never forget what I saw. All the doors leading in from the outside were locked. Nothing could be in there, but still I saw something. This creature, about the size of a grizzly bear it had to be. It had blood red eyes, but no fur nor hair. It had cracks in its skin that had what looked like lava flowing through them. It should not have been able to see me, but it looked right at me and rammed itself into the door. Thankfully, the door didn't open. I locked it and ran to sit down on a chair by the door. Don't get the wrong idea, I'm a scaredy cat. I'm not brave. I only sat down because I didn't believe what I just saw. I needed to take a breath, think things through. But then I heard scratching at the door. I began to tremble then. I decided that if it wanted in, then I could open the door and surprise it with a knife. So I stood behind the door and opened it slowly. There was no sound, no scratching, no breathing, just dead silence. I peered into the garage. There was nothing, no monster, no water bottles on the floor, nothing. I looked at the inside of the door, expecting to see scratch marks, but there were none. It was then I heard my little brother scream. I ran up the stairs as fast as I could, and I ran to the bathroom door. I told him to open it, and he did. I asked what happened, why he screamed. He explained that the lights turned off, and he felt something touching his shoulder. These are only some of the creepy and scary things that have happened to me. I do still sometimes feel as if I'm being watched. There are moments where I thought I felt a hand on my shoulder. But in the end, I just hope that whatever these things are, they stay away from my family. Monster in the Woods From Anonymous I was 13 years old back then. I lived in a medium-sized town close to a forest preserve, about two minutes away from us. My family and I often walked down those trails. They curve up and down every which way, so it can be difficult in spots to see up ahead very far. It was October, but there were still leaves on the trees. One day after school, I came home and put my bag down on the ground. I went into the kitchen, which overlooks the backyard. In the backyard, I saw something strange. There was this animal the size of a grown man on the ground. It was about 10 feet away from me. Even though it was still quite bright out, the creature was pitch black. It seemed like a shadow had peeled itself off the ground and crouched down. All my breath was taken from my lungs and I just stood there. Eventually, it looked at me and froze its black eyes drilling into my soul. Then it stood up, revealing legs. They were unnaturally long, and with impossible speed, it ran towards our fence and jumped right over. I was so shocked, I just stood there, with a terrified expression on my face. Eventually, I broke out of my shock. Being the ignorant teenager I was, I ran outside onto the street, looking both ways. On the left, I saw it again. It saw me as well and ran down the street. It ran down the path to the forest preserve and I followed it. Walking down the path, I noticed something weird. It was quiet, and I mean like it was absolutely silent. No bugs, nothing. I was slightly weirded out by this but kept on walking down the path. About halfway down, I saw it again. That thing was standing there over a dead deer in the middle of the trail. Again, I found myself unable to move. 
once more had spotted me. It then let out the loudest, most ear-splitting screech I've ever heard and began running towards me. I began to run back, faster than I'd ever run before. Maybe it didn't want to catch me. Maybe adrenaline can do some pretty fascinating things. But I managed to make it home, slamming the door behind me and collapsing on the couch. I was both exhausted and terrified. I could hear it walking outside for some time, before finally leaving. When my mom got home, I didn't tell her about this, knowing that she wouldn't believe me. I didn't tell anyone else either. For now, I haven't seen it again. That Ugly Evil Dead Woman From Anonymous It all started when we moved into what my sisters and I called the Orange Mansion. The house had three bedrooms, four bathrooms, and even a pool. I was eight years old at the time. Jade and May, my two sisters, were both ten. We were quite young still, and we let our imaginations run wild. We'd play games and even pretend we were princesses in a palace. But after nightfall, all that fun would come to an end. You see... Every night since the first night, we, even my parents, would feel as if we were being watched. We would see things in the corner of our eyes. Objects would move around when we were not there. I remember when it all started. One night, a few weeks after we settled in, we were all asleep when a faint yet noticeable thud came from the closet. Now the closet was connected to the large attic above, at first, we assumed it was nothing, as our parents told us this house was old, so perhaps it was settling. We went back to sleep. A while later, we didn't hear a thud, but what we did hear was much worse. This time, it sounded like something was trying to tiptoe across the floor of the attic, but not with feet. This sounded like darts when they're thrown onto a wooden plank. This went on for about 30 seconds but it felt like an eternity as it moved across the floor above us. After that, that same night, I had a dream. A wonderful dream. In it, I woke up and the walls became solid gold. The windows were covered in gems ranging with color, and the bed we were sleeping in had velvet sheets on a mattress that felt like a cloud. Then I heard my mother start singing downstairs. I stepped out of the bed, and as I did, I woke up my sisters to get them to follow me. We reached for the mountainous shining door. Then, before we could open it, I woke up. It was a wonderful morning. I then noticed my sisters had already went downstairs. But then I saw something. The closet was open, and so was the door leading to the attic. Being a curious girl, I wanted to know what was in it. I wanted to see what could possibly have been making that noise. I squeezed myself through the tiny attic door as I walked up the steps. I peered into the attic with caution, but found nothing. Now, since there was a ray of light bleeding into the attic, I decided to step in and investigate. Still, I could find nothing that could have made those sounds on the floor. That was when I saw the marks. Large claw marks on the floor. But there was only one long streak, as if someone had gone ice skating across the floor. Seeing this made my imagination go wild. I began to feel like something was watching me. So I ran. I ran like my life depended on it. The rest of the day started to feel boring compared to that. The activities and games we played started arguments between us. It was as if something was trying to ruin our fun, and possibly even our family. That night, the same thing happened again. Noises coming from the attic. Soon, the noises turned into what we all thought was a woman singing. My fear, once great, turned off, and we were able to sleep. Then came another dream. My sisters and I woke again in that beautiful palace. Then came that singing. We ran for the door, and once we opened it, it was as if we passed through the gates of heaven. A staircase led straight from our room and spiraled downstairs. 
The stairs were comprised of quartz and bronze. Streams of water fell from above our heads, and the walls around us were covered in beautiful gemstones. We ran downstairs, and once we made it to the bottom, there was this other woman. It wasn't our mother. I remember her saying, Good morning, darlings. I bet you're all hungry. She snapped her fingers, and before us appeared a feast of food. There were cookies, brownies, and food I'd never seen before. Being confused with all of these emotions, we kindly told her that we were okay and that we should probably get going. That was apparently the worst move. The sweet lady started to transform into something I never thought was possible. Her skin began to rot, her eyes became black, a black fluid welled up in her eyes and spilled over. Her clothes turned to dust, revealing these long, disturbing, spider-like legs. As we ran to the room, we could hear that devil screech. Come back now, or I'll gut all of you and hang your heads. We didn't turn back. We ran up the stairs. They felt as if they kept getting longer and higher the more we ran. The moment we finally touched the handle of the door, we all woke up together, all at once. It was still nighttime. We tried to get out of bed, but none of us could move. We couldn't even scream for help. After what seemed like years of trying to move, the same sound of the tiptoeing came back. Then what made all of us want to die was when she spoke. We heard her voice above us coming from the attic. Come back now. You all have been invited to dinner. I began to pray out loud. I don't think she liked that. No one can save you. No one can hear you. You'll be with me forever. Then, everything went quiet. So quiet I could hear my ears ringing. The sound of the night had gone. Then, that thing above us let out the worst shrill shriek, scaring all of us to death. It was a mix of sounds, really. The sound of a woman screaming in pain and terror. The sound of a deep, dark, devilish roar. The sound of nails scraping across a chalkboard. The noise was louder than anything I'd ever heard before. We all cried, yet we were still unable to move. My heart pounded. It hurt. It was like my chest was going to explode. But then, I woke up again. Had that been a dream too? I looked over at Jade and May. They were fast asleep. May even had a slight smile on her face. Then when I thought it was over, it happened. The door to the closet creaked open ever so slightly, and there staring back at me, plain as day, was that ugly, evil, dead woman. She, or rather it, just crouched down on the floor, staring, even drooling at me. Even though I was young, I knew what it was doing. It was playing with my mind. It slowly shut the door and vanished into the dark. Come morning, the first thing I did was run to my father to tell him everything. He looked pale. He told my sisters and I to stay down with our mother. We ran to her and stayed quiet. Suddenly, we could all hear the shriek of our father's voice as he ran downstairs and told us all to get out of here. Then he called the police. Not even 20 minutes later, I couldn't even count the number of officers that had showed up. While all the commotion was going on, I asked my dad what was happening. All he told me at the time was something was in the house, something bad. My sisters, my mother, my father, and I soon found refuge somewhere else. It was only when I was about 10 years old, my father finally revealed to me what actually happened. He had woke up early that morning to find a strange liquid covering the floor, and the front door was covered in crude and deep strokes, as if someone had carved markings into it. 
The strange liquid led up the stairs, and as his eyes followed, he saw this long, distorted, disgusting thing staring at him, crouching at the top of the stairs. He said before he could quickly grab us, get mom and call the police, the thing vanished before his eyes. When this happened, the door and the liquid all disappeared, and everything went back to normal. He said the moment I gave him a description of that creature, he knew he wasn't just seeing things and went to go take a look. When he opened the closet, the stairs to the attic were open already, and at the top, that old sinister woman was just sitting there. Her clothes were stained with similar liquid. It reeked of something rotting, and blood ran from her mouth. As she reached out for him, her hands became not hands anymore. They were more like spikes protruding from her, with bits of flesh falling from them. Warning. The following story contains depictions of violence against pets. My friend's dog saved our lives. From Anonymous. One year around mid-September and early October, I went to visit a friend of mine who lived in Oregon, basically up in the middle of nowhere, where it's really all trees, trees, and more trees. For security reasons, I'll call him Tom. Tom lived alone with his dog, a pit bull named Nemesis. Despite his breed, he was a very kind and charming dog. I lived in California, so the drive up to Oregon was a pain, but I've known Tom since kindergarten. I would do anything for him, considering him my best friend, and I knew he would have done anything for me. Anyway, I eventually make it to his little cabin. It's not the best in its class of cabins, just a small two-bedroom place with a living room and a small kitchen. When I first stepped out of my car, I noticed a couple of things. First, it was awfully silent, like you could hear a pin drop silent. Second, the moment I entered those woods, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched or even being followed. I greeted him at the cabin door. We talked about how we were and played with Nemesis a bit. We hung out until the early hours of the morning, which was around three. After that, Tom showed me where I was staying. I unpacked my things and got into my sleep attire and went to bed. Only about an hour later, I began to hear noises outside. I couldn't make out what it was exactly, but as I got up, I heard a faint scream, followed by what sounded like a screech and a woman screaming at the same time. Instantly, I jumped out of bed and opened the window next to my bed a bit. I listened for about two minutes straight, but by then, there was nothing but silence. I sat there looking at the window, thinking I was tired or just hearing things. In that moment, as I was reaching for the window to shut it, I heard it, a girl screaming for help, followed by that screech scream sound coming from the woods outside. Right away, I ran to the door, swinging it open to be greeted by my friend and nemesis. Did you hear that, Tom? I asked. Yeah, yeah, I did. Let's go check it out, see what the heck is going on. I was about to take off when Tom said, wait, we shouldn't go out there unarmed. You can never be too sure. He then ran over to his chest, opening it to pull out a small pistol. He handed it to me, and he took his 22 LR. The screaming and screeching was getting louder and louder. Together, we bolted toward the origin of the noises. When we came within about 50 feet of the woods, I shouted, Hello? Hello? Anyone, out, Anyone there? out there? And as if to answer me, the cry for help came again. Follow our voices! Follow our voices. Tom shouted. Several seconds more of us shouting back, we made out a figure of a girl running through the brush and trees. As she got closer, we could tell that her clothes were all torn up. She had blood on her arm, back, legs, and her abdomen. When she saw us, she had a startled look on her face, but she ran even faster towards us. When she got to us, she didn't slow down and practically crashed into me, knocking us into the ground. Tom then shouted, What the heck is that? 
As I lifted my head above the girl's shoulder, I saw this thing. It was charging at us on all fours. As it moved, it gave off this squishy sound, like when you get your shoes wet and step in them. The creature itself was very skinny, but what really stood out to me were its eyes. They were a bright, fiery red. Tom, run! Tom, run. I shouted at Tom as I picked up the now weakened girl. We made a mad dash back to the cabin. Tom ran in front of us, the girl constantly shouting to hurry. Here and there, Tom shot at the thing. I think some of the shots connected, because a couple of times when he fired, it responded with a screech, something that sound pained. Even so, it was getting closer and closer to us. We were nearly to the front door. In that instant, I turned around to see if it was following us, and I saw that creature in more detail. Though it was skinny, it was still huge, not like bulky, but long. Its skin was all fleshy with patches of hair. Its hands were too long, ending in sharp points. I wasn't watching my footing, and I was a bit startled by that thing's appearance. My foot ended up getting caught on something. I fell with a girl to the ground. I pulled the pistol from my pants and readied myself, but no matter what we did, it was like there was no stopping this thing. Then out of the corner of my eye, I saw Nemesis come out of the door and charge at the creature. Nemesis jumped, biting the thing on its forearm. The creature cried out in pain, and it turned its attention to Nemesis. Then the dog ran into the woods, the creature on its tail. Soon after, there was nothing but silence again. We got inside the cabin, locking everything up. Then we tended to the girl's injuries. By then, she was unconscious. We put the girl in my room. Tom and I stayed in the living room, waiting for Nemesis to come back. Or, in the worst case scenario, that creature. By 10 a.m., there was no sign of Nemesis. Tom went out with his gun in the direction Nemesis had run off to, and I stayed at the cabin with that girl. About two hours after Tom left, the girl came too. She told me that she had gone outside to see why her dogs were whining. When she stepped outside, that creature began chasing her. She ran through the woods, trying to lose it, and that's when she found us. Branches and brush from the forest apparently cut her up real bad. Not long after the girl told me her story, Tom came back. Nemesis, our hero, didn't make it through the night. He lay lifeless in Tom's arms. We buried him that day. I know if it wasn't for Nemesis, I wouldn't be here to tell the story, nor would that girl. But one thing is on my mind to this day. What even was that thing? The Thing Under the Light From Corey C. I live in Ogden, Utah. This took place just a little south of that. About a year back, I was hanging out with some of my friends. I was at a youth activity thing for my church, and our bishop wanted us to go to a park to play night games. After a couple of hours of fun, it was time for us all to leave, and before I left, I had to use the restroom. As I walked over to the bathrooms toward the door, I gave it a yank only to discover it was locked. So as any young man would do, I made the best of the situation. I went over to the side of the building. Just as I was about to zip up, the motion lights across the building just turned on. I knew it wasn't me that set them off. What I saw under the light was the most disturbing thing. A tall and slender creature, about three quarters of the way up the tall light, as I stared at this thing, I noticed its eyes, or lack thereof. Where I assumed its eyes would be were just black pits. I couldn't move, I was so scared, but also I felt curious. Then I watched as the creature beckoned me towards it, yet it didn't seem like it wanted to move towards me. It just wanted me to go to it. At this point, after I was done silently freaking out, I was finally able to move. 
Instead of going towards it though, I turned and ran as fast as I could, making my way back to my friend's car. When I got there, they saw I was visibly upset. I slammed the door shut, demanding we leave the park as soon as possible. Once we made it back to the church, they attempted to calm me down, but they were not successful. They decided to take me to my parents, who stayed up with me all night as I cried. All I know is if that light hadn't turned on, that thing could have gotten me, and I never would have saw it coming. The Haunted Van From Blake C. I was on my way to a local junkyard to get a gas pump for my truck, specifically a 2002 Ford Ranger. It was a horrible truck and didn't run well at all. When I arrived, there were tons of cars, some crushed, some in perfect condition, but the most noticeable one was an old Volkswagen van, which looked as if it were from at least the 1970s. It was very run down. Now, this junkyard was bordered by a dense forest. I started over to the van, and when I reached it, I tried to open the door, but the thing wouldn't budge. I looked more closely at the door, and I saw that there was a piece of rusty metal wedged between the door and the frame. After a bit of struggle, I managed to pull it out. Then I slid the door open. I stepped in and immediately smelled mold, and everything was covered in dust. I began poking around. I found some old papers and clothes, but then I stepped in something, something wet. I took out my pocket flashlight and shone the light at my foot. I was expecting water, if anything, but what I found my foot in was a puddle of warm red blood. Horrified, I kept myself from freaking out and ventured forward a bit more to the back of the van. Once there, I found more old papers and clothes. On my way out, I tripped on something. I shone the light at my feet again. There was a deer's severed leg there. I don't know how I didn't see it before when I went into the van, but at that point, I was scared. I ran out of the van as quick as possible. The following day, when I went back for the pump, as I was leaving, I looked over at the van and I swear I saw two red glowing eyes staring at me from the still open door, and I could smell a horrible stench like rotting flesh. I quickly got out of there. I don't know what's up with that van, but I hope they turn it into scrap metal. Was it just a dream? From Angela This happened about three years ago, and to this very day, my hair still stands on end when I remember it. It was late in the afternoon. I was getting my three girls ready for bed, getting things ready for the next day, too. It was a normal night, but I got to bed a little later than usual. Before heading to bed, I walked around the house, checking the doors and windows because of an odd sound I'd heard previous nights. I wasn't sure what it was, so I kept making sure everything was locked up tight and that all the windows were shut. After I went to bed, I fell asleep for a few hours when something woke me up. Immediately, I noticed a strong smell. It was like musty, wet dog. I found this very odd, as we didn't have pets at the time. I looked around, but I was instantly frozen by sheer horror. There was this thing. I can only explain it as a werewolf standing on two legs. I could hear it breathing and I could see its breath in the darkness of my room. As soon as I made eye contact with it, it turned to run off in the direction of my daughter's room. I jumped up, terrified, and I ran after it. I'm not really sure what I was planning to do, but I was not going to let it get to my kids. As I ran in the direction it went, I had to pass by the back door which led to the kitchen, then down a long hallway to my girls' bedrooms. I made it to their rooms, and they were all sound asleep. 
there was no sight or sound of the creature. I walked back to my bedroom. When I got to the kitchen, I felt that fear once again. The back door was wide open. Even though it had been locked tight and shut just before I went to bed. I couldn't help but wonder what just happened. Did I dream this? Was there really something in our house? If it was just a dream, how was the back door wide open? Still to this day, I question if I'd actually seen it or dreamt it. Later on that week, there were a few nights I couldn't sleep. I stayed up in the living room doing word finds, and on one occasion, I heard something very large running across our roof. Of course, I didn't go and investigate, but I did hear sounds in the woods too, sounds that I could not explain. I just can't get over that night. Can a dream really hit every one of your senses? I could hear it breathing, see it, feel it. And I watched it. It was so tall it had to duck through the doorway. I just don't know. I don't like the dark anymore. And I do not like being out in wooded areas. It never bothered me before this event. The following story is an update to a story I've previously narrated. For context, I'll add the old story here first, followed by the new addition to the story. The Woman at the Bus Station From Brittany K I had gone to visit my aunt in Los Angeles over vacation break from school since the students were split into different track colors. Mine was green, and we were off for the entire month of January in 1999. By the 22nd of January, I was ready to go home to spend the remainder of the month with my parents and siblings, before of course heading back to school. My mom had asked my grandfather if he could get me from my aunt's house, and we'd catch buses back home. Early Saturday morning on January 23rd of 1999, I felt anxious and I just wanted to get going. So my grandfather and I were dropped off at a Greyhound bus station where we would be catching a bus to San Francisco. By the time we got there, I was starving, so my grandfather asked me to stay put inside the station while he left to go get us some food. You see, my grandfather had this jolly personality about him. He never saw the bad in people, so he didn't think it odd to leave me at the station. Meanwhile, he ran an errand. I felt scared being that I was only 13 years old. I was standing there surrounded by our bags and a crap ton of people. A few minutes later, this middle-aged woman approached me and kindly but firmly suggested to me that I should take a seat and watch some TV with her. Since there were these mini TVs connected to every seat that were activated by inserting quarters on the side of them, I was hesitant for a few seconds but my legs had grown tired from just standing there waiting. The woman helped me collect the bags and take them over to where the benches were. Then we sat down. She gave me some quarters to activate a TV. And then we began to watch a black and white show that appeared. She then began to make small talk with me. I told her that I was waiting for my grandfather who had gone to get some food, to which she nodded up and down and confidently declared, Yes, I know. I felt confused by this. How would she know that I was waiting on my grandfather? I was beginning not to trust the woman, and at that point I wanted to get up and go back to where I'd been standing, but my legs wouldn't budge. I was frozen in place. I glanced over at the woman and she smiled at me, then gently nodded towards the TV screen since it had turned off. I just sat there for a minute. Then after what felt like ages, I shakily inserted another quarter into the side of it. It buzzed back to life. I stared into the screen, not actually watching what I was seeing. I began to wonder why this woman was actually here, and what would happen. And yet I still could not move from the seat. I really don't know why I stayed there at all. I was scared, and I just wanted my grandfather to magically show up so we could go wait for our second bus on route home. Almost as if the woman had read my mind, I heard her say to me, 
Your grandfather sure is taking a while, isn't he, sweetheart? I squirmed a little at this. I just wanted to leave. I wanted to go home. After what felt like another hour, my grandfather had finally shown up with a puzzled expression on his face. He walked over to me and asked, Who helped you bring the bags over here? They're too heavy for you to carry. I must have looked a certain way because he then softened his tone and asked me, Sweetie Pie, who, who was here with you? I looked up at him and said, There was this woman, Grandpa. She gave me quarters for the TV. Am I in trouble? Tears began to well up in my eyes, but then he surprised me by asking, Sweetie, where is this lady now? I looked at him feeling confused turned around to see that there was no one there, no one at all. In fact, the previously crowded station was empty. It was just me and my grandfather. When my grandfather had dropped me off at home some hours later, I immediately told my mom about the lady at the bus station. My mom tried to lighten the mood, telling me that maybe she was an angel who was sent to look after me. But now that I'm older, I can't help but wonder what on earth that woman actually might have been, what she potentially had planned for me. I guess I'll never know, but that smile, it was far too creepy to be from an angel. The Strange Girls From Brittany K. This is unofficially The Woman at the Bus Station Part 2. After having met this strange otherworldly woman at the San Francisco Greyhound bus station, you guessed it, I had another similar experience. I can't recall the time of year exactly, or what day it even was, but it was about a year after I had that creepy experience, while waiting for my grandfather to return back to a bus station, where he left me for a couple of hours to get us some food. I was 14 years of age by this time. I was in high school. What I'm about to tell you is so beyond far-fetched even for me, and I'm the one that experienced this. So the high school was a good 20 minute walk from my house, and as I made my way home one day out of nowhere, two girls around my age appeared a few feet behind me while I was walking on a sidewalk in my neighborhood. I found this extremely odd, just because where the heck were these girls seconds before I noticed them? There had not been any intersecting street since I had reached my neighborhood, and if they had come out of a house nearby, I would have noticed right away, since I had become a paranoid kid and would always check my surroundings. Almost as though they heard my thoughts, I heard one of them call out for my attention. Hesitantly, I turned to face them and awkwardly responded, uh, Yes? The girl who had spoken had an ear-to-ear -ear smile plastered across her face as she walked over to me and her friend followed behind her. She then motioned towards her friend, and I know that she had mentioned a name, but I can't remember what it was exactly, so I'll replace it with Nebula. Nebula tells me that you're an interesting subject. She grinned as if she was highly pleased with this. Both girls took turns bringing up experiences from previous years, my experiences, incidents where I was the only one around at the time. Their questions went something like this, Do you remember the time when you were eight years old, and you really wanted to eat some freshly baked cookies, but you were asked to wait until later, and you didn't want to wait, so as soon as no one else was in the kitchen, you grabbed a mitten, and you took some, then wrapped them inside a napkin and ran off, so you wouldn't get caught in the act. I dumbly mumbled something incoherent because I was in total disbelief, to which they both replied in unison, Yes, yes we, we know. know. Another question they gave me was, Remember when you were about ten years old? Your brother and you had been playing with the small bouncy blue ball outside, but then your brother tossed the ball so far, it landed inside of a dumpster enclosure. You felt very bad because your brother began to cry, so you trespassed inside the enclosure, but you couldn't find it anywhere. Then you prayed it would magically reappear, and while you were still inside the dumpster enclosure, he called your name out 
and let you know that it had bounced back into his hands as if out of thin air. I was fear-stricken to the core and just stood there gawking at these girls, talking about things they shouldn't know about. I couldn't breathe properly. My heart felt like it was beating in my throat. Then to my horror, their eyes flashed white for about three seconds while they both smiled ear to ear at me. The lead girl then placed her hand on my right shoulder and said in a low but crispy clear voice that dripped with such certainty that it gave me chills up and down my spine. We will be watching you. We have always been watching, Brittany. I just wanted to get the heck away from them, and when I turned back to look at them as I walked away, which was only about a second after that, they simply just weren't there anymore. After my experience at the bus station the year prior, I became that paranoid kid. And so after this particular encounter, I'd completely shut everyone out of my life. I was in denial for the longest time, and I had decided to just keep it to myself. Even now I'm in tears, because it was a terrifying experience to stand there and have these two beings dissect me with their eyes, and have this all-knowing, creepy freaking smile plastered across their faces as they took turns rehashing things that had happened in my life when no one else was around to see. There were a few incidents they pointed out, incidents I had always believed in my heart had been miracles, and now that they knew about them, I didn't know what to think. And the times when I had done something bad like steal cookies, I know how stealing cookies would sound hilarious to anyone, but growing up in a deeply religious household, my parents called anything stealing even if it was food from our own fridge. I had to ask permission to do just about anything. Throughout the years, I began to question my own faith, and I always wondered what these girls could have possibly really been, because no one's eyes just flash white like that if they're truly human. This is the first time since it happened that I've brought it up to anyone. I feel so strange about it even now. My brother was about four years old at the time his toy ball had disappeared and reappeared, so I don't think he remembers at all what he had told me about it having had bounced back to him out of thin air. I know that he would eventually have said something over the years, but he never has. Has anything like this ever happened to you? Because now I'm absolutely paranoid. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an EerieCast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com, such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to eeriecast.com slash plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.